Hey, this is Warren Redlick. I want to talk to you about battery day again. This time I want to focus on the vehicles. Uh, what does it mean for what does this, what does this mean for our future products? And products like grid storage that battery day's news translates into what that means for Tesla vehicles, Powerwall, Power Pack, and Mega Pack. For 2021, 2022, and 2023, and how that translates into revenue, I got some pretty mind boggling numbers for where Tesla's heading in 2023. Are you ready? Let's go. We're talking about 100x growth in batteries for electric vehicles. And then on the grid side, 1600 times growth from today's grid batteries. Tesla was very clear. Elon Musk and Drew Baglino were very clear that we're going to see multiple chemistries. And most importantly, in my eyes, lithium iron phosphate is a really, really important chemistry for Tesla's future. In addition to lithium iron phosphate, they talked about a medium nickel battery chemistry. They have two different kinds of battery chemistries that they're working on. The one that got the most attention was the high nickel chemistry, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the medium nickel chemistry, which is the current nickel cobalt aluminum with some improvements and what sounds like the future of nickel manganese without cobalt, these chemistries are going to advance the state of the mid-level Tesla products, the Model S, the Model X, and some other products. Lithium iron phosphate is going to be focused on grid storage and lower end vehicles that don't need a lot of range and aren't mass sensitive. Semi is mass sensitive and Cybertruck can be mass sensitive. So the high nickel batteries are the most important for those applications. For robo taxis and for grid storage, mass is not very important by comparison. And so they'll be able to get by with the improved lithium iron phosphate batteries that are the result of some of the things they talked about on battery day. There's, um, you know, while there are some limitations on the total amount of nickel produced every year, there's really no limit on the iron. There's so much iron, it's ridiculous. So you can really scale up uh, iron phosphate, um, you know, at a raw materials basis, faster, more than you can nickel. Uh, but yeah. And just, just to point out, you know, when we were walking through this presentation, we intentionally separated all the different aspects. The benefits of structural battery apply to a iron-based cathode in the same way they apply to a nickel-based cathode. Yeah. So you get longer range uh, uh, iron-based vehicles. And also the silicon benefit can apply to the iron-based vehicles as well. So there's, we can do a lot to extend the range of an iron-based vehicle, which is why it's a key part of the roadmap going forward. One thing that stood out was for the future, most of the improvements discussed, it sounded like a lot of the improvements were for the high nickel only battery solution. But when you dug into it, and Drew Baglino said it at one point, a lot of the improvements are going to translate to lithium iron phosphate and to the medium nickel chemistries. An interesting question down the road is whether the medium nickel chemistries will survive or whether they'll become unnecessary. But it's not just about nickel. In order to scale, uh, we really need to make sure that we're not constrained by total nickel availability. Kind of a three-tiered approach to, to batteries, we're starting with iron, that's kind of like a medium range and then nickel manganese as sort of a medium plus uh, intermediate, um, and then a high nickel for long range applications like Cybertruck and uh, the semi. Now, something like a, like a semi truck, it's extremely important to have a uh, high energy density uh, in order to get long range. Just to give sort of iron a, a bit more time, like the, you know, if you look at the uh, white ounce per kilogram at the cathode level of, um, of iron, uh, it looks like nickel is twice as good uh, but when you've fully considered at the pack level, everything else taken into account, uh, nickel is about maybe 50 or 60 percent better than uh, uh, than iron. So I iron is not is a little better than it would seem when you t when you look at it at the, uh, the pack level fully considered. Um, it's, still, it's not as good as nickel. Nickel is like 50 to 60 percent better, uh, but it's still it's actually pretty good. Um, and so, you know, good for stationary storage and for uh, medium range applications uh, where energy density is not paramount. And then, like I said, for intermediate, uh, it's kind of a nickel manganese. Um, and it's uh, relatively straightforward to do a cathode that's uh, two thirds nickel, one third manganese, uh, which would then allow uh, us to make 50% more uh, cell volume uh, with the same amount of nickel. And with very little energy trade off. I mean, yeah, just enough to, to, to have you still want to use 100% nickel for something like a, 
a semi truck, but but really not much of a sacrifice. At all. Yeah. It seemed to me when I heard it that the high nickel chemistry served one purpose, the lithium iron phosphate serves another purpose, and the medium nickel probably becomes unnecessary as high nickel production escalates. The diversified cathode approach was most transparent and they talked about it most clearly when they showed this slide where you can see an unknown vehicle under a tarp, what looks like a Model 3, and what looks like Power Pack or Mega Pack under iron-based long cycle life. Then the next section shows Power Wall, Model Y, Model S, and Model X as nickel manganese long range. That one seemed a little odd. I thought the Model S and Model X looked different. That might be a reflection of Project Palladium, which is going to be a redesign of Model... It's a rumored... There's a rumored redesign of Model S and Model X, and I thought the Model S and Model X shown here looked a bit different than the current Model S and Model X. Others disagreed with me when we talked about it. I thought it was interesting that Powerwall was included in the nickel manganese section, Powerwall is not mass sensitive. It seems to me that all grid storage applications should be lithium iron phosphate. Lithium iron phosphate is the lowest cost and it also has high cycle life, which means it lasts longer and grid storage tends to have high demands for high cycle life. So it's not clear why they included Powerwall in that section. I would suspect it was a casual mistake. But it is possible there's a reason why they're suggesting nickel manganese for power wall. Maybe it's volume. They don't want the power wall to look too big. But overall, I would think they would want to offer lithium iron phosphate, get the cost of power wall down as much as possible to increase installs in homes and encourage people to install solar, which goes with power wall. The high nickel section showed Tesla Semi and Cybertruck as, quote, mass sensitive. Very clear that that semi is mass sensitive. Tractor trailers can pull a maximum load of 80,000 pounds, including the truck, including the battery pack. The more weight you take out of the battery pack, the more weight you have available for cargo. So it is very, very important for semi to minimize weight. I was a little surprised about Cybertruck being in this category. It makes sense that the tri-motor Cybertruck with the plaid powertrain is going to have the advanced battery pack, the high nickel batteries. Just like Model S Plaid, which is, Model S is shown with nickel manganese, but Model S Plaid is very clearly going to have the high nickel batteries. Roadster is not shown, but Roadster is going to have the high nickel batteries. You almost wonder, why isn't Roadster here? Have they decided not to produce Roadster, the fact that they left it out? There is an argument that Cybertruck needs, is mass sensitive because it's rated to have a payload of 3,500 pounds. And if the battery weighs too much, that might impair the ability of Cybertruck to carry a heavier payload. So that may be the reason. I suspect that there will be lower battery level. I, I suspect that the single motor Cybertruck will use lithium iron phosphate batteries. I made another video about it where I talked about Cybertruck because of its size, because of its length and width. There's a lot of room under Cybertruck for more batteries. Lithium iron phosphate is actually a bigger challenge on volume than it is on mass. So I suspect that lithium, and I'm gonna talk about this more later in the video, but I think we're gonna see a diversified cathode approach to Cybertruck itself. That there will be lithium iron phosphate Cybertrucks and there will be high nickel Cybertrucks and there may very well be a nickel manganese version as well. I'm not sure if this diversified cathode approach slide was intended to be accurate or just intended to be illustrative, to illustrate what they have in mind. So here's what I think we can expect for battery production in the year 2021. Elon and Drew talked about achieving 10 gigawatt hours in 2021. I want to be clear, it's very possible what they were talking about was the run rate by the end of the year. In other words, by the end of the year, they will be on an annual pace of 10 gigawatt hours but that doesn't mean they will produce a total of 10 gigawatt hours in 2021. I'm gonna go with it as if they produce 10 gigawatt hours in 2021, and keep in mind my numbers might get pushed back half a year or so if it's really run rate rather than total for the year. 10 gigawatt hours is a lot of batteries. 
That's enough for 100,000 Model S vehicles, Model S's and Model X's that have 100 kilowatt hour packs. It's enough for 10,000 Tesla semis. In addition to the high nickel batteries, Panasonic is increasing its nickel cobalt aluminum production at the Nevada Gigafactory. They may reach 30 gigawatt hours of nickel cobalt aluminum. We've also heard that Panasonic is adding an additional line in Nevada. It sounded to me like that's going to be a 4680 lithium iron phosphate line rather than a nickel cobalt aluminum line that Panasonic is getting into producing lithium iron phosphate batteries for Tesla. And they're getting into producing the 4680 cell format, which is going to be important for future Tesla designs, particularly at the Austin Gigafactory. CATL has started or is about to start delivering lithium iron phosphate batteries in China. That will grow. LG Chem is delivering nickel manganese cobalt batteries in China. That will also grow. Nickel manganese cobalt and nickel cobalt aluminum are the current medium nickel solutions. It seems likely they're going to shift at some point to a straight nickel manganese chemistry without cobalt, but we haven't seen that that's happened yet. We don't know when that's going to shift. LG Chem is producing those nickel manganese cobalt batteries in China for China production. It's possible that LG Chem, LG is a Korean based company. It's possible LG Chem might do more for Tesla from Korea. We don't know about that. So we're looking at totals for 2021 of 10 gigawatt hours of high nickel, maybe 40 gigawatt hours of nickel cobalt aluminum and nickel manganese cobalt, and maybe 10 gigawatt hours of lithium iron phosphate, maybe more. There's a good chance that'll be more. The first vehicle I want to talk about for 2021 is the Plaid Model S because they showed it off at Battery Day. Plaid is coming. The only thing faster than ludicrous is Plaid. Plaid Model S matters because it's a halo car, just like Roadster. Roadster is also a halo car. A halo car is a vehicle that helps brand the company. It shows we're awesome. The fact that Plaid Model S will be the best production vehicle, the fastest, highest performance production vehicle ever, will stand out and show that electric vehicles from Tesla are not only as good, but better than internal combustion engine vehicles. It knocks out all doubt about that question. That's why halo cars matter. It offers outrageous performance, extreme range, 520 or more miles. It's going to cost a lot. $140,000 is the price they announced. That price might come down as battery production scales. One of the challenges Tesla faces is with the early production of high nickel, there's going to be a low yield. It is close to working. Well, I, I can't, I can fair to say it probably it does work, but with not a good, not a high yield. Yeah. So we're still ironing out the kinks, but we've made tens of thousands yeah. of cells, thousands of kilometers sure. of electrode. They're going to try to produce 100 batteries and only 50 of them will be good or 30 of them will be good. So the cost of that first set of batteries is going to be high. That's why you have to incorporate those batteries in the most expensive vehicles and why you have to charge more for them. At some point, Model S and Model X are probably going to shift to new body engineering. Drew Baglino and Elon Musk talked at Battery Day about a new style of body engineering where they would have a front piece a front section cast, a rear section cast, and the two are put together with a structural battery pack. So with that structural battery pack and all that together, it seems likely, because there's been a lot of talk about a Project Palladium with a new Model S and Model X coming, it seems likely that that will happen with Model S and Model X sometime in 2021, and that will be in the Plaid Model S production version. A question we don't know the answer to is how big will the pack be? Will it be a 120 kilowatt hour pack or will it be maybe a 150 kilowatt hour pack? There was some earlier talk about a 200 kilowatt hour pack in Roadster. I don't think that's necessary. By my numbers, 120 kilowatt hours might be enough for the Plaid Model S to reach 520 miles. The current Model S long range with the current body engineering, which is less efficient, achieves over 400 miles with a 100 kilowatt hour pack. So if you increase that by 20%, you get to 480 miles. Then you add an improved vehicle engineering and other benefits. I think they can get to that 520 miles with just 120 kilowatt hours. That matters because the less they use per vehicle, the more vehicles they can make. Now that high price of $140,000 means limited volume. 
I don't think they're going to sell more than 5,000 Plaid Model S's by the end of 2021, especially if they start late in the year. And if they only sell 5,000 units, that means they only use between 600 and 750 megawatt hours, which leaves a lot of batteries left if they're going to make 10 gigawatt hours in total. So Plaid Model S will not make much of a dent in the high nickel battery production. Tesla Semi is probably the biggest money story for 2021, the biggest industry changing story for 2021. It has the biggest need for high nickel because of that mass sensitivity. That 80,000 pound weight limit, every pound counts against cargo. So the, every pound they can take off of the battery is a pound that they can use in cargo. They said they were going to do 300 mile range version and 500 mile range version. If they follow Tesla's pattern, they will only offer the 500 mile range version first. I'm not sure it will happen that way. One of the interesting things is that Tesla's route, I actually measured this, Tesla's route from Fremont to the Nevada Gigafactory is less than 300 miles. So it could make sense for Tesla, at least for themselves, to make a number of 300 mile range Tesla semis, which is probably a 600 megawatt hour pack, and maybe make some 500 mile range semis. On the other hand, they're gonna be able to charge more for the 500 mile range vehicle. So I think there's a really strong chance that all or most of the vehicles they produce, the Tesla semis they produce in 2021, will be the 500 mile range versions. They said that the 500 mile range version will be able to charge 400 miles at 400 miles of range while charging in just 30 minutes at a mega charger. Well, that should be impressive to see. And that means we're gonna see mega chargers roll out as well. 10 gigawatt hours of high nickel battery production in 2021 can serve 10,000 Tesla Semi 500s. I'm going to call them the Tesla Semi 500 and the Tesla Semi 300. So they could serve 10,000 Semi 500s or 16,000 Semi 300s. Another reason why I think they're going to go primarily with 500s in the first year, there's a good chance that Tesla will have trouble scaling up the manufacturing of Tesla Semi in 2021. So it would make sense again for them to do the higher cost, lower volume version first. I'm predicting that Tesla produces 5,000 Tesla semis in 2021 using about five gigawatt hours. And that leaves another five gigawatt hours for the 2021 Cybertruck Tri-Motor. The Tri-Motor will also use high nickel batteries and will have the Plaid Tri-Motor powertrain. It will achieve zero to 60 times of 2.9 seconds. This is gonna be a rocket and it's gonna have 500 miles of range. With its $70,000 price, not including full self-driving, this is probably going to be the highest demand vehicle for high nickel because Plaid Model S is going to be a $140,000 vehicle that few can afford, and Tesla Semi is going to be limited just because they're going to have trouble producing enough volume. I'm estimating for Cybertruck, because it will weigh more than the Plaid Model S, I think, that it will need a 150 kilowatt hour pack to reach that 500 mile range. Like Semi, it should be able to charge 400 miles in 30 minutes or less at a supercharger. We'll see about that. The battery chemistry that was discussed, it sounded like this battery chemistry would be able to charge and discharge at higher rates because of the tabless design minimizing heating. 25,000 tri-motor Cybertrucks would be four gigawatt hours of high nickel batteries. And keep in mind, all Cybertrucks will probably use a structural battery pack, which will, minim which will reduce weight it's probably going to be part of the design of Cybertruck. They haven't really exposed how they're going to do. They never really talked about how the, the chassis for Ch Cybertruck would be designed, but it seems likely that they will do this structural battery pack connected to the steel exoskeleton. Moving out of the high nickel batteries, 2021 should also see the Cybertruck dual motor, the one I reserved and I'm very excited about. I am predicting that dual motor will use at the base level lithium iron phosphate batteries. I'm predicting that dual motor will be able to deliver 300 miles of range with an 80 kilowatt hour lithium iron phosphate pack. And keep in mind, because I've said, because Cybertruck's design, I made a video about Cybertruck's design for batteries. It has a lot of room for batteries under there and lithium iron phosphate is volume challenged. The volumetric energy density is not good. So those batteries take up more space but Cybertruck has a lot of room underneath it. Much, much more room than Model 3, Model Y, Model S, or Model X. A lot of room for batteries under there. So I think they're gonna go with lithium iron phosphate. It's the easiest way to deliver a lower cost vehicle. But I think there's a really strong chance that Tesla will offer an option to go to the medium nickel batteries 
on the dual motor Cybertruck to get extra range. You'd pay extra money and you would get the medium nickel batteries. I don't, it's possible they would go with high nickel, but I don't think they'll have enough high nickel to extend that down to the dual motor range. So with a nickel cobalt aluminum or nickel manganese or nickel manganese cobalt version, they could do a 100 kilowatt hour pack and get 350 or more miles of range. And maybe they charge $5,000 extra to do that. Most likely all batteries going into the Cybertruck since it's a new vehicle will be that 4680 cylindrical size. And I am still speculating that Panasonic's new line at, Nevada, at the Nevada Gigafactory is a 4680 LFP line, lithium iron phosphate line. And there's a really strong chance that they will either add new lines with 4680 nickel manganese or 4680 nickel cobalt aluminum using the tabless architecture that reduces heating and makes all this stuff viable. Let's talk about Model Y and Model 3 next. I'm going to group them together because they're largely the same design. Currently, Tesla's Model 3 and Model Y in the United States is made only in Fremont, and Fremont is using the old structural design. They're basically using the old design without the structural battery pack in Fremont. It seems likely they will shift to the new body engineering design that they're developing in Berlin once they get it down in Berlin. They'll move that to the other factories. Texas will probably also go with the new body, the new structural engineering and the structural pack. At some point in 2021, I think we can expect that Model 3 and Model Y will switch to the structural battery pack and the new body engineering. We can expect Fremont to produce about 500,000 Model 3s and Ys together. Texas will come online sometime in 2021, and we can expect them to produce 250,000 Model 3s and Model Ys. The average Fremont pack will be 60 kilowatt hours. That's 30 gigawatt hours from Giga Nevada using nickel cobalt aluminum. I'm predicting that, it be, that once Texas comes online, they'll be producing lithium iron phosphate versions of Model 3 and Model Y with 50 kilowatt hour packs to get about 300 miles of range. I anticipate that they will offer 75 kilowatt hour nickel cobalt aluminum and nickel manganese packs. Or maybe they'll be able to go to 80 kilowatt hours and they should be able to up the range to 350 miles on Model 3 and Model Y. And by the end of the year, I expect that architecture to be true across all factories in North America, Shanghai, and Berlin. That covers the vehicles for 2021, but another important sector for Tesla is grid storage and solar. And then on the grid side, uh, we have a similar mountain to climb. 1,600 times growth from today's grid batteries to go 100% renewable on the grid and to take all of the existing heating Fossil fuel uses in homes and businesses, 100% electric. Yeah, and, and this, this number, I think, uh, might grow even more depend, you know, as the, the world economy uh, matures. Batteries don't relate directly to solar, but most home solar installations will also use Powerwall. So if they can get Powerwall to be less expensive, it will make home power, it will make home solar installations less expensive, and that will make it easier to sell home solar and increase home solar installations as well. Now grid storage being mass insensitive, not worrying about mass, should use lithium iron phosphate chemistry entirely. It shouldn't have to use nickel cobalt aluminum, nickel manganese, or the high nickel chemistries. Lithium iron phosphate costs less to make per kilowatt hour and has great cycle life, meaning it lasts long, which is really important for grid storage applications. Going to the 4680 cylindrical cell size with tabless architecture should also reduce the cost of lithium iron phosphate. Lithium iron phosphate is already the least expensive technology used by Tesla. This is going to dramatically reduce the cost of lithium iron phosphate batteries even more. We're gonna get down to possibly below $50 per kilowatt hour for lithium iron phosphate, maybe 40 or less. So far, Tesla has been doing lithium iron phosphate through CATL and it seems likely they will extend that to other partners like Panasonic and possibly LG Chem. Elon was asked about whether Tesla was only going to make the high nickel batteries or whether Tesla would also be making medium nickel and lithium iron phosphate chemistries. And Elon said in a tweet, we're only going to do high nickel and they're going to let their partners make the other ones. So it seems pretty clear Tesla's focusing on the high nickel. I wouldn't be surprised if Tesla gets frustrated with suppliers at some point and decides to make their own. On the other hand, BATL and LG Chem and Panasonic all seem pretty motivated. And if Tesla gives them a good reason, they should be able to scale up and provide the batteries Tesla needs. 
I'm just concerned Tesla's demand for batteries is so high they may feel, you know what, these guys can't get it done. But CATL in particular looks really motivated and really competent. So I think there's a really good chance they'll get their end done. Now, as I mentioned before, the battery day graphic indicated Powerwall would use the medium nickel chemistry. I think that's wrong. I think they will decide it's easier to go with Powerwall with lithium iron phosphate, get the cost down. Currently, a Powerwall costs about $6,000. I think with lithium iron phosphate and economies of scale and other advantages, I think they're going to be able to get the cost of that Powerwall down to $4,000. If you're buying solar for your home, instead of spending, instead of spending $12,000 for Powerwall or $18,000 for Powerwall, now you're spending $12,000 or $8,000 for Powerwall. Saved a lot of money and it's a lot easier to persuade people to do that installation. And it's probably easier to, to persuade people, you know what, instead of getting two Powerwalls, why don't you get three? In addition to Powerwall, there's also Powerpack and Megapack. Powerpack is the commercial scale grid storage application that businesses would use. And Megapack is the utility scale storage application that utility companies use to manage their grid, especially when they're doing wind power or solar power, large solar power projects. But even without that, it's valuable for many reasons. That's likely to scale up and the increase in production of lithium iron phosphate batteries from partners like CATL should spur a significant increase in megapack, power pack production as well. And we're gonna see a much greater level of that in revenue for Tesla. For vehicles, 2022 will see the introduction of the single motor rear wheel drive Cybertruck. That's the low end of the line starting at $40,000 and having only 250 miles of range or more. A $40,000 highly capable pickup truck should have extremely high demand. I anticipate a lithium iron phosphate version with a 60 kilowatt hour pack and 250 or more miles of range. They might get to 280, maybe 300, but probably won't quite reach 300 miles with a 60 kilowatt hour pack. And they might offer an upgraded version of that single motor with a 75 kilowatt hour nickel cobalt aluminum nickel manganese pack, or they might just squeeze 75 kilowatt hours of lithium iron phosphate in. For mass sensitivity, it might make sense to go with 75 kilowatt hours of the medium nickel battery will weigh less per kilowatt hour, and that'll be an advantage. And maybe that would be a $4,000 upgrade from the $40,000 price. Again, the challenge with Cybertrucks is to be able to handle that 3,500 pound payload, but that's a trade-off you can offer the consumer. Also in 2022, we should very clearly by that time see Project Palladium come to reality, redesign Model S, redesign Model X, new body engineering, structural battery pack. That should be extended to the full line, not just in plaid. I am predicting, and it's something I haven't heard from anyone else, that the Model S and the Model X external dimensions will shrink. They will get narrower and they will get a little shorter. This is very important for European and Asian roads. They're very big. I have a fairly large garage, and if I got a Model S or a Model X, it would be a tight fit. In my, we'd make it work, but it would be tight. I'm buying a Cybertruck, which is going to be even bigger, and I'll fit that in. According to the slide that they showed, Model S and Model X would initially be offered with nickel cobalt aluminum and or nickel manganese batteries, the medium chemistry batteries. By 2022, they may have shifted over all battery production to that nickel manganese high-end 4680 format. And so that's probably what's going in S and X for starters. Model S long range should reach at least 450 miles of range and Model X should go over 400 miles of range. Currently, Model X is only at 350 miles of range. And I think there's a chance that Giga Berlin will open a Model S line. Model S competes with the Mercedes S-Class and the BMW 7 Series and arguably with the BMW 5 Series and the Mercedes E-Class. And Europe is a key place for Tesla to compete. So it might make sense for Tesla to open up those vehicles in Europe as well. And it would be killer, especially with the new body engineering structural battery pack. And maybe they decide to go with a lithium iron phosphate pack on a relatively low end Model S. Still really nice inside, all the great features, but they can save a lot of money by going with a lithium, with a lithium iron phosphate pack and get that Model S pricing down around $60,000, which would really make it competitive with the BMW 5 Series, not just the 7 Series, with the Mercedes E-Class, not just the S-Class. And that's a much larger market. There's a lot more sales that they can attain there. Moving on to the Model 3 and the Model Y, by 2022, all Model 3s and Model Ys should have adopted the new body engineering that was discussed at Battery Day 
including the structural battery pack. And they'll probably all be on 4680 cells and all battery production should have shifted over to 4680 cells. There probably won't be any 2170 or 1865 cells formats left. I am predicting that the Model 3 lithium iron phosphate version price will drop to under $30,000, making it extremely competitive with vehicles like the Toyota Camry and Honda Accord. That would come with a 50 kilowatt hour pack and 300 miles of range. Similarly, the Model Y lithium iron phosphate would be offered with a 54 kilowatt hour pack to get that same 300 miles of range. 54 kilowatt hours is the current standard range plus pack on the Model 3 and Model Y. And that would be maybe $33,000. Again, very, very competitive with a lot of normal, with a lot of SUVs, extremely competitive and take a lot of sales from a lot of vehicles. Then you'd have the Model 3 Long Range Nickel Plus with the nickel manganese chemistry. I'm predicting the long range version will be $39,990. I'm with an 80 kilowatt hour pack and a 350 mile range. The long range Model Y would be $43,990. And because it also has an 80 kilowatt hour pack, it would have slightly less range, probably 340 miles. It's possible Tesla will get aggressive and offer a Model 3 Performance Edition with the high nickel battery pack and 80 kilowatt hours, that would be able to do zero to 60 in 2.9 seconds, a big jump from the current 3.5 seconds, and reach 340 miles of range. The Model 3 performance with high nickel would probably be in the $50,000, $55,000 range. And then if they get really aggressive, they could do a Model 3 plaid with high nickels and a 100 kilowatt hour pack. That would be more expensive, perhaps $69,990, zero to 60 in 2.5 seconds and a 420 mile range. That would have some advanced performance engineering to enable that. For 2022, we'll see Cybertruck rounding into full production or growing production. The single motor rear wheel drive Cybertruck will start with a 60 kilowatt hour lithium iron phosphate pack. The dual motor all wheel drive will have an 80 kilowatt hour lithium iron phosphate pack. And the tri-motor will have that 150 kilowatt hour high nickel pack. We'll probably see a global Cybertruck Wolverine reveal, a smaller Cybertruck that Elon hinted at, that the current Cybertruck platform fits with North America and doesn't really work in a lot of other countries. We are designing the Cybertruck to meet the American spec, because if you try to design a, a car to meet the global, the, the super set of all global re requirements, it basically, you can't make the Cybertruck. It's impossible. Um, so... Uh, it, it really is designed for the American market, but this is the biggest market. The North American market is the biggest market for pickup trucks by far, or large pickup trucks. And then I think for, uh, in, we'll probably make an international version of, of the Cybertruck that'll be kind of smaller, you know, kind of like a tight Wolverine package. Um, it'll still be cooler, but it'll be, it'll be smaller because you just can't make a giant truck like that for most markets. But if Cybertruck turns out to be popular and they think they have high demand in other countries, it makes sense for them to release a smaller format Cybertruck for other markets. 2022, we'll see the introduction of the Roadster. The base model will do zero to 60 in 1.8 seconds. Why 1.8 seconds? Because Plaid Model S is doing it in 1.9 seconds, so the Roadster has to be faster. We're gonna see a quarter mile in 8.5 seconds, better than the 8.9 in Plaid Model S. We're gonna see 620 miles of range, a 150 kilowatt hour high nickel pack, the battery weight will be under 450 kilograms. I have a theory that they're going to do an entirely new system of body engineering for Roadster. This is a guess. A couple of theories. One theory is they do a single casting of the whole frame. Another theory is that they're going to do a 3D printed frame. This is going to be a really exotic vehicle. And I've seen some articles and, and videos talking about how 3D printing and artificial intelligence can generate a really, really exotic high performance frame. And since it's a really, really exotic high performance vehicle, it might make sense for Tesla to try that with Roadster. It would be optimized for rigidity. It would be optimized for weight. And the frame would be extremely lightweight and extremely strong. The Roadster will have the 400 watt hour per kilogram cells that Elon talked about. And uh, before battery day, Elon tweeted that they thought they would achieve volume production of 400 watt hour per kilogram cells, the highest en energy density cells. Within about three years, well, for Roadster in 2022, they won't necessarily need high volume production. So if they're able to produce a little bit of these 400 watt hour per kilogram cells, that could go on Roadster. The battery weight for that would be under 400 kilograms, maybe 375 kilograms. 
that would achieve zero to 60 in 1.7 or even 1.6 seconds, quarter mile in 8.2 seconds, and a 650 mile range. And then maybe they're gonna do the SpaceX package, but I think that's gonna wait till 2023. The other big thing is in 2022, it's likely that Tesla will do a reveal of the compact vehicle they talked about, they hinted at it, they didn't really hint at it, they said we're gonna do a compact vehicle on battery day. Yeah, we're confident that long-term we can design and, and manufacture a, a, a compelling $25,000 electric vehicle. About three years from now, uh, we're confident we can make a very, com uh, very compelling $25,000 electric vehicle uh, that's also fully autonomous. And when you think about the $25,000 price point, you have to consider how much, in it, how much less expensive it is to own an electric vehicle. Yeah. So actually, it, it's, it, it becomes even more affordable at that $25,000 price point. But it was covered in a tarp and they wouldn't say more and they wouldn't say more and they wouldn't say more. My theory on the compact is it's going to be a global platform. That the underpinnings of the vehicle will be the same worldwide. The China version, the European version, the US version, and the Japan version. I think there's going to be a Gigafactory in Japan. That's coming in a video soon. That they will all have, all have the same underlying platform, but the body, the, the top, the part that you see, will have custom design for each market. So we'll see a China sedan is my guess, a Berlin hatchback, somewhat like the Volkswagen Golf, because a lot of people have talked about that. US, it might be a compact SUV, a four or five passenger, probably a five passenger SUV. And in Japan, who knows? I think maybe something more like the Berlin hatchback for Japan, but it'll be a Japan design. Could be something cute, Japan likes cute cars. One theory is that the compact will use whole frame casting. Another theory is that they'll take this 3D printing AI model that they're going to do with, with Roadster and extend that to the compact. Either way, it will use the structural battery pack designed for 4680 LFP. They very clearly said that this vehicle would use the, the lithium iron phosphate batteries. This vehicle will be lightweight and hyper efficient. A 40 kilowatt hour pack will deliver 300 miles of range. And that's really important because the less batteries that each vehicle uses, the more vehicles they can make. The compact won't be made in 2022. Or it, won't, it, won't be, it won't be released in 2022. It'll start being sold in 2023, which we're coming to soon. Solar and grid storage will start blowing up in 2022. One possibility is a Gigapack reveal event. That for utility scale storage, they will have an all-in-one solution with one gigawatt hour that will be available in 2024. Most of these large utility scale store, uh, battery storage projects are already a gigawatt hour or more. So why not go ahead and have a simple solution that does that? I'm also predicting, and like I said, this will be in a video coming soon, that Tesla will announce Terra Australia and Terra Japan, each of which will be designed, will start off to produce solar and grid storage. I also think we're going to see a second China factory site somewhere inland in China, possibly the city Chongqing, which is a big city in the middle of China. I'm expecting CATL to open a lithium iron phosphate battery in Australia to supply the grid storage products that will be made by Terra Australia. And Panasonic will produce lithium iron phosphate in Japan to power the grid storage that, Japan will, that the Japanese Gigafactory will produce. The low cost of Powerwall combined with solar will dramatically increase sales. I'm going to get to some hard numbers for you in 2023. So now we're in 2023 and this is where it gets fun. I'm anticipating that the high nickel batteries will be produced in substantial volume in Shanghai, Berlin, Texas, and also in the Fremont factory. I'm ballparking it at 60 gigawatt hours each for Shanghai, Berlin, and Texas, and another 20 gigawatt hours produced in Fremont. By this point, lithium iron phosphate production will have scaled up dramatically by Tesla's partners, CATL, maybe LG Chem, and Panasonic. I'm expecting to see 300 gigawatt hours of lithium iron phosphate batteries produced for Tesla in 2023, and this matters a lot. We'll see 100 gigawatt hours of nickel manganese production by Tesla partners like Panasonic and LG Chem. That's a total of 600 gigawatt hours of battery production. If they only use that or Model 3 and Model Y 50 kilowatt hour packs, it would be 12 million vehicles. 12 million vehicles in one year. Not what they're gonna do with it, but that's what they conceivably could do with 600 gigawatt hours of battery production. I'm anticipating 150 gigawatt hours of lithium iron phosphate batteries will go to grid storage, and the other 150 gigawatt hours will go to vehicles. 100 gigawatt hours of nickel manganese will go to Models 3, Y, S, and X, and maybe some to Cybertruck, 
and 200 gigawatt hours of high nickel production will go to Semi, Cybertruck, Trimotor, Plaid Model S, and Roadster, which will be relatively low volume. It's also likely that a European partner will produce lithium iron phosphate batteries somewhere in Europe, probably near Berlin. So with 150 gigawatt hours of batteries for grid storage from lithium iron phosphate, I anticipate 30 gigawatt hours going to megapack projects. These are rough estimates. 30 gigawatt hours for power pack commercial installations. That's 120,000 power packs. And 90 gigawatt hours for home and small business power walls. That's 6 million power walls. The revenue from that adds up to $24 billion for the power walls, $12 billion for the power pack, and $12 billion for Megapack are $48 billion, but that's not all. When you install Powerwall, you're usually installing solar. So as a rough guess, and I think this might actually be conservative, that would be $100 billion of solar revenue for a total revenue of about $150 billion. We're going to see where this adds up at the end of 2023, and it's going to knock your socks off. For Model 3 and Model Y, figure 100 gigawatt hours of nickel manganese. With an average pack of 75 kilowatt hours, that's 1.3 million Model 3 and Model Y. Figure another 50 gigawatt hours of lithium iron phosphate goes into Model 3 and Model Y globally. That would be another million vehicles. So that's 2.3 million vehicles total. Figure an average selling price of $40,000 and you get $92 billion in revenue from Model 3 and Model Y in 2023. Tesla Compact is going to go on sale in 2023. Expect 50 gigawatt hours of lithium iron phosphate to go into the Tesla Compact. With an average 40 kilowatt hour pack, that's 1.25 million vehicles. With an average selling price of $25,000, that's $31 billion in revenue. And that's going to increase dramatically in 2024 when they go into volume production of the Compact, but I'm not getting there yet. We're not doing 2024 in this video. In 2023, we can expect Cybertruck production to also start hitting full tilt. I'm not covering Wolverine. I don't know if they're going to achieve Wolverine in 2023. I'm just going with U.S. cyber truck production, which will primarily be used in U.S. and Canada. Expect 50 gigawatt hours of lithium iron phosphate to go to the lower end cyber trucks. That's around 700,000 vehicles. With an average selling price of $50,000, that's $35 billion in revenue. These are ballpark numbers, but I don't think they're far off. 75 gigawatt hours of high nickel battery cells would go into 500,000 trimotor cyber trucks. An average selling price of $75,000, that's another $37.5 billion in revenue. 10 gigawatt hours of nickel manganese batteries would go into 100,000 dual motor cyber trucks. With an average selling price of $65,000, that's $6.5 billion in revenue. Total revenue adds up to $80 billion for cyber truck. For 2023, we've got the Model S and X and Roadster. Personally, I think this is a small part of the Tesla story, but it's still something. Figure 5 gigawatt hours of nickel manganese goes into that. The average 100 kilowatt hour pack, that's 50,000 vehicles. Average selling price of $80,000, you get $4 billion in revenue. The Plaid models plus Roadster will sell in low volume with high nickel batteries. That's another billion dollars in revenue. So that's $5 billion in revenue total for that. And in 2023, Tesla Semi expect 100 gigawatt hours of high nickel batteries to go into Tesla Semi. With an average 800 kilowatt hour pack, 600 kilowatt hours at the low end and one, me one, one megawatt hour at the high end, that's 125,000 vehicles. That's about 50% of the U.S. market for Class 8 trucks. They'll probably sell them in Canada. They may sell them in other countries, but it's primarily going to be in the U.S., and it's going to wipe out the truck market for everyone else. At an average selling price of about $150,000, that's another $20 billion in revenue. So when you add up all this revenue, you get $150 billion for grid and solar. You get $90 billion for Model 3 and Model Y. You get $30 billion for the Tesla Compact. You get $80 billion for Cybertruck. You get $5 billion for Model S, X, and Roadster. You get $20 billion for Tesla Semi. This adds up to nearly $400 billion in total revenue. That's up from tw about $25 billion in revenue the 2019 2020 years for tesla i think tesla is going to be maybe 30 billion in 2020 we're not done with the year yet but going up to 400 billion is a monster jump it's a more than 10x increase in revenue in three years and this is just plain and simple math from the battery production we're expecting them to achieve it's monster and that does not include robo taxi revenue 
if Tesla actually is able to get the robo taxi network running by 2023, and I think it will happen in 2022, if not end of 2021, the robo taxi revenue is going to skyrocket revenue well beyond this. So if you think about it, if Tesla is able to more than 10x revenue in three years, the market cap of Tesla and the share price are going to go way, way above their current value. Tesla will already in 2023 be the most valuable company in the world. And the share price is going to go from what's currently around $400 a share going to be $4,000 a share or more by 2023. Is not only are we going to see this volume of revenue, the growth is going to be apparent and the growth is going to continue. And that's not even considering the increase in value if the robo taxi network goes live. So Tesla is a monster growth story. They're going to have great vehicles that are going to be better than anything the ICE industry has to offer and anything any EV competitor has to offer. And we can hope that other EV pet competitors will come along. We haven't talked about a van. Maybe there'll be a van. Maybe it'll be Cybervan. Wouldn't it be nice to be cy see Cybervan? And Cybervan would add more revenue as well. We'll see where that goes. But just on these simple numbers, we've got an insane valuation for Tesla in 2023. And anyone who thinks that Tesla is overvalued at $400 a share just isn't thinking. So let's have some fun. Let's get excited. I'm personally excited for my Cybertruck to come next year. I'm excited for my friends who are going to get different vehicles. My wealthy friends who are going to get Roadsters and Plaid Model S's. That's going to be out of my price range. But this is going to be a lot of fun. Let's get excited. I should make one mention of my friend Joe Ramos. Joe Ramos sponsors this channel. He is a, an IT consultant who can help people anywhere in the United States and probably in Canada. Check him out in the description below. And if anybody else is interested in sponsoring this channel, I'd love to talk to you. My email address is available. And if you like this video, please subscribe. Please tell your friends. I'd really appreciate your support on Patreon. It really helps out. There's a lot of other YouTubers who benefit from Patreon. It's going to help me improve the look and feel of my videos. But please check out my other videos. Please subscribe. Please tell your friends. Share this video. Thanks very much for watching.